Hello everyone and welcome to Critical Praxis Week 9. This week's topic is really generally about this notion of post-humanism or the post-human uh, state that we're in. The topic is set by Nico and Nico asks us to read a brief article by Nicholas Gain called Post-Human. Uh, and the questions are, how do you understand post-humanism, and what ways might or does a post-humanism uh, inform your own work? How can the everyday user draw on post-humanism as a means of living a critical life? Now, I really like this topic, and I kind of want to start off with the idea of post-humanism, uh, I guess, in a larger frame. That this term gets deployed in a lot of different contexts, and it means a lot of different things. So everything that anyone will say this week in particular are just various ways that this kind of uh, emerges as an idea. Now, Nicholas Gain writes, uh, well, first off, Nicholas Gain actually draws on Donna Haraway's work from her mid-1990s book, uh, Simeon's uh, Werewolves and Cyborgs, I believe is what it's called. Uh, or, uh, I'm sorry, Simeon, Cyborgs, and Women, The Reinvention of Nature. And uh, in this uh, book, Haraway outlines uh, these three key boundaries uh, that have helped preserve the sanctity of the human, uh, or D Nicholas Gay Gain writes, the human as a self-contained being. And those three relationships that uh, Haraway and then post-humanism is generally uh, calling into question is the relationship between humans and animals, saying that one is not better than or above another one. The second relationship is between animals as humans and machines. So this notion of the organic, uh, inorganic, but maybe uh, functioning, moving thing. And then the third relationship would be between the realms of the physical and the non-physical, which in some ways can kind of lead to some spiritual dialogue. Uh, and, and the work of Gloria Anzaldúa, for instance, particularly comes to mind in her idea of spiritual activism uh, and what it means to bring that up to the realm of accessible uh, spaces for knowledge as well. And so uh, ultimately what posthumanism is for me, and I do agree with Nicholas Gain here, is that it's really uh, decentering uh, humans so that humans are no longer the most important things in the universe, which is what he writes on page 432 of the article. And by the way, the citation will be uh, below in the subject uh, container. Now, now, how does uh, my own work get framed in terms of post-humanism? Well, I can turn to an article that I did have published in an NCA, the National Communication Association, one of uh, their or our journals called Communication and Critical Cultural Studies. Uh, that piece is called Queer Imagining Liminality as Resistance in Linkvists Let the Right One In. And in that article, I'm interested in, or at least I extend the work of Noreen Giffney and Myra Hurd. Uh, they have a collection that's called Queering the Non-Human. And so they certainly are not explicitly using post-human uh, words per se, but at the same time they are, which I have found in a lot more British-leaning queer theoretical work is already kind of in that space. And I feel like a lot of American-based queer theory is kind of moving towards that space, or in some ways has been there always. But in my work, I have been interested in how humans are constructed, how subjectivity or subjecthood or even agency is enacted, and who has access to actually be dubbed or deemed human based on certain types of access to certain uh, rules, regulations, laws, what have you. And so one instance I suppose that comes to mind is uh, the ongoing marriage equality debates and that if we were to define in rhetorically in some capacity that accessing marriage is the way that you get access to certain rights and regulations that like for instance uh, health care that like let's take for instance me and my partner for instance um, that my partner is able to buy into this uh, health care program that I have as a graduate student it is local, it's not great, but it's something that if we were not together in a civil union, my partner would not have access to. Uh, federally, uh, we are still not recognized, at least in the state of Illinois, well, anywhere actually federally, but in the state of Illinois, it's civil unions, not marriages that are recognized. Um, if we were to define that access, for instance, to healthcare is one way that we can define the human, right? Someone who's able to access healthcare, we might wanna call them a human. To deny that, uh, health care, one avenue being through marriage, for instance, is to deny the the ability to be dubbed or called human, to not be part of the actual social apparatus of those who we might dub human. And so one of the questions that, that comes to mind in terms of how this gets rhetorically deployed is that those people who are not able to access those, those systems, those safety nets that we might consider um, uh, perks of being a human, at least in this particular system here in the U.S., including access to health care, is the question of uh, who and systematically who gets denied access to that thing. So for instance, to say that you are a queer couple, you are a non-polygamous couple, you are whatever equals you cannot share health care would also mean that you also do not have access to the same type of human status as others. 
This is not an over-exaggeration. This is an absolute belief that I hold, that, that this is the way that we can construct certain arguments to understand the impact of how this works, that, that, that denying health care, whether it's through marriage or through not even having a universal health care system in place here, is to deny humanity to people. It is to deny the ability to live one's life out as a fully functional or fully functioning uh, participant as a human in this human project, this endeavor here. It is to say that certain bodies are privileged over certain bodies. And so for me, in the way that I deploy posthumanism um, isn't necessarily per se about the cyborg body, uh, but rather how subjecthood gets defined, who gets to be called a human, and so on. Uh, that's a large portion of my work, right, that really gets informed in that space. And this is where the ongoing dialogues and critical praxis feed into here. When we talk about things like intersubjectivity or even power in the classroom, whose voice gets heard, who are we seeing, but more importantly, as a result of these systematic practices, who are we ignoring or who are we not dubbing or granting human status to? That's a very important uh, question, in my opinion. Another uh, key point or, or space where posthumanism emerges in my work uh, I would say deals with the idea of looking and locating alternative ways of thinking. And what I mean by that is deep privileging the humanist perhaps tendency to uh, know things and what it would mean to take on a radical passivity or Halber what Halber Judith Halberstam uh, would call radical passivity or to just simply not care or the notion of not caring as a form of knowing, which in some way is a non-humanistic way of approaching the world, that you do not want to move forward, that you want to just stay in your place and resist. And what manifests as a result of that resistance of not doing something? This is uh, still ideas that I'm working on right now, but it's certainly in a new space. Now, I think that by taking a perspective, uh, at least from my, my first point that really informs a lot of my research, by focusing on how people are uh, subjected into a system, how they are granted human status, is an important pragmatic application in the real world, so to speak. And I'm not saying real world as in out there versus academy, because they are both parts of the real world in very different capacities. And I really do not appreciate that binary of out there in here. Uh, there is certainly a in, in the ivory tower, not in the ivory tower, I can buy that completely, but in terms of uh, humanity, uh, for instance, being granted, uh, the real world exists all around us. And for instance, we talk about issues of privilege, like for instance, privileging the academy, when that becomes the mode, the mode of uh, being granted some sort of respect or a sense of humanity, that for instance, myself, as a person who's in graduate school right now, I am then granted humanity. Whereas those who do not take school, formal school, as a mode of getting or gaining or gathering your information and your, your knowledge, are not granted the same human status in the same way. In fact, that's why alternative knowledge sometimes is demeaned and not looked at in the same capacity. Certainly I'm in the academy, and so in one way I'm privileging a certain type of knowledge, but I don't think that that means that we need to dismiss alternative knowledges and alternative ways of getting about that same space. And so in one way I advocate for an expansion of humanism, and by that I mean really what I believe in is debunking and pulling away and deterritorializing what human is allowing our bodies to bleed out, not literally, but metaphorically, uh, so that we can see that there are other ways of being that are equally valid and equally important. And I think until we can challenge ourselves to decenter ourselves as not being in the center of the universe, that until we can get to that place, we will struggle to see other ways of being or other modalities. And it's important to move to that space so that we can start hearing voices that are already talking. It's just hard for us to hear, perhaps. Uh, that's what I want to say this week, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the responses. Nico's work is incredible, uh, along with, I believe we have Poe uh, this week, as well as Sam uh, talking this week, and I'm looking forward to what they have to say on this topic. I think it's very important. It is certainly a space that we're moving to, and I think that it proves very, very fruitful, for not only for critical thinking about how subjects are constructed, but also pushing the boundaries of what subjecthood itself can mean, should be, or maybe shouldn't be at all. Uh, until next week, I'll see you all, and have a great, wonderful week. Farewell.